to the third day of DEF CON. Actually, I'm happy to see that uh, as many of you uh, managed to get up this early on Sunday morning. Uh, I've been asked to uh, show you this uh, part of today's schedule. And as you can see, this is the first presentation. And um, I'm going to uh, present and discuss some issues for designing buffer overflow exploits. Uh, mainly focusing on small payloads. My name is uh, Anders Ingeborn, I'm from Sweden, and just before I begin, I'd like to um, give away some free stuff. Yeah, I get a spare one. If you ask me a question I cannot answer, then I better throw the microphone at you. Actually, I saved a T-shirt for the one who um, asks a question that that I can answer. Okay, I guess everyone can hear me, right? So few people here. So, what? This year? I don't know, it was like four. <laughs> oh, you got me. <laughs> okay, I better get home. <laughs> As you can see, I tend to lose them quite quickly. <laughs> okay, anyway, why would anyone be interested in buffer overflows? I can see two reasons. These attacks are very effective. They are very flexible and very useful. I mean, you can run your own code on the target system. You can run basically whatever you want if you manage to exploit an application. If you, n if you exploit an application that uses an allowed protocol, it will go tr through a firewall. Let's say HTTP or FTP or something that's allowed to pass the firewalls and uh, IDS, IDSs and so. So that's the first reason, effective and flexible attacks, really cool stuff. And then um, the second reason why anyone would be interested in buffer overflows is that they are very common. I read this report, it's two years old now, but uh, from the Oregon Institute of uh, Science and Technology, I think, and they stated that uh, buffer overflow has been the most common, the single most common um, computer security flaw or problem for 10 years. So that's another reason to be interested in these things. And why would anyone be interested in me? Besides, I'm easy to trick shirts from. <laughs> well, why would anyone be interested in uh, small payloads? The reason that I myself got interested in it is because I, uh, I was dealing with an exploit for an application that, um, that used a mismanaged bounce check. They were doing some kind of bounce check, but they didn't get it perfectly correct. And so by playing with small payloads, I think that uh, you can add to the number of possible applications to exploit. As a benefit, it turns out that these uh, suggestions and these um, design issues that I present will um, make it possible to evade some intrusion detection systems, both network-based and host-based. And I'll get back to that later, of course. First, how many of you are um, 
perfectly sure about buffer overflows and how many need a little reminder. How many need a reminder? Yeah, at least one. You won't get a t-shirt this time. OK, let's say an application does a string copy operation without a bounce check. Then that will mean that, um, that the function will copy data from one memory, one place in memory until another and go on until it reaches a null byte. If it doesn't reach it, it will go on copying and overwrite memory and overwrite and write outside the memory that has been reserved for that uh, variable, which means that you will, o you will overwrite your stored instruction pointer and you may jump into your own code. Excuse me? Speak, speak louder. Oh, there's no volume, but I am. Okay. Okay, here's a picture of it. Let's say you do a function call, then you store your instruction, original instruction pointer on the stack memory. You reserve space for some local variable, and then you perform a string copy. Without a bounce check, you will overwrite the instruction pointer, and then you may jump back into your own code or jump wherever you want in memory. So this is pretty cool. But let's say some vulnerable server performs a bound check. Let's say it receives data over, the n over a network connection and uh, implements some sort of bound check on the receive call, but then not on internal copy functions or such. Then we have a restriction. Then we have an, a bound check that we have to uh, somewhat get around to exploit this application. I see two possible ways of doing this. Either we can uh, write a simple, small exploit code where the um, where the ex exploit itself is small enough to fit into this uh, restricted memory and still do what, uh, what kind of exploit we want to do. It's a little naive, but it's okay, and that's what we did in uh, our last winter. Another approach, which might be better, is to change the design concept somewhat and make a double injection, and that is basically what I'm going to uh, present here today. But first, this, um, first, let's have a small look at the um, uh, straightforward, simple, small exploits. It will imply at least two functional requirements for the exploit itself. It has to be able to listen for requests over a network and execute those at system commands. That's basically what we want to do when we exploit an application. And we also have a requirement to keep the number of bytes as low as possible. Last time we did it, we came up with an example that was just above 250 bytes. We used two libraries, Windows Sockets and Kernel 32. We used the Datagram socket instead of a Stream socket because UDP don't need to do, um, because with UDP you don't need to do any listen or accept calls and you save a few bytes. And then we went into a loop doing receive and executing with window WinExec from Kernel 32. If you want to have a look at this one, you can download it from Security Focus. It's about half a year old. Now for the second approach that I think it's, it's much more cool is to change the design concept and do a double injection. And I, of course I will explain that on the next slide. Um, besides changing the design concept, we can also try to use the existing network connection and try to reuse the already loaded libraries to further minimize and optimize our code to get even smaller. So that's two parts, change the concept and optimize. So what do I, what do I mean by double injection? Let's say you have a server process in the middle that listens for connection over the network and when it receives a request from a client, it um, calls an internal parse and execute function to uh, um, yeah, well, <laughs> to parse and execute. And it looks like this. And the server is running. Let's say we are at this place in the server code. And some client over the network calls the server. Then when the server receives the first call, the first command or request or whatever, the server will uh, call the parse and execute function and store the uh, uh, current instruction pointer onto the stack memory on top of its uh, stack frame. Stack frame number one belongs to the server process. And call jump into the instructions of the parse and execute function. The parse and execute function will receive 
a stack frame of its own, which is being placed above the um, service stack frame onto the stack memory. And then the parse and execute performs a string copy call. So let's say we have a restriction on the number of bytes for the first call from the client to the server. But let's say we have no bounds check within the parse and execute functions call to string copy. Then the first payload we send through the first call will overwrite down the second stack frame and overwrite the instruction pointer. Excuse me? Yes. Yes. So the, the, the stack grows upwards and, and uh, variables are written downwards on the stack. On the next uh, few couple of slides, I have written memory addresses too, as so you can see them. But not in this very fine animation. The first time I made a, po made a PowerPoint animation. Well, anyway. Uh, OK, the second part of the double injection is when the uh, first payload executes and listens for a second injection or a second call from the client. It reads the second payload and stores it higher up on the stack where we have free memory, a lower address. Then the first payload, when it has received the uh, uh, entire second payload, it jumps up to it and continues to execute the second payload. We're still executing on the stack. And then the second payload can perform the actual exploit, and by that I mean open a shell or add uh, an account or whatever that we want to do to exploit this host server. The benefits of doing this is, of course, that we get lower memory requirements for the first payload. And it's basically only the first payload in this uh, approach that is interesting. Because if the first payload is small enough, then the first stack frame, that one that belonged to the server, will be preserved. And if it's preserved, then we might be able to do a clean return to the calling function. And if we can do this clean return, the server function will not crash. And if it doesn't crash, we will get no log entry on the system. And if we will get no long log entry, we will evade some host-based intrusion detection systems, mainly those that just um, parses log files. OK, part number two, or trick number two, is to use the existing connection. And that means that we let the server open a new socket and receives the first payload. And then we uh, manage to get the first payload to receive the second payload over the same session by using the same socket. Benefits of doing this is that we uh, do not need to set up any new connection. And um, if we don't need to set up any new connection, we will, or we might, evade some intrusion detection systems, some network-based intrusion detection system that looks for TCP handshakes or that looks for unrecognized elite ports over the network. But we're using the same still allowed protocol, the same still allowed port number. It's the same session. And that will make it harder for network-based intrusion detection to see it. Of course, we will also get even lower memory requirements for the first payload. And that's a benefit, too. OK. I hope this sounds cool. But how can we do it? I have made a small proof of concept implementation that I'm giving away after this uh, speech or after DEF CON. I think I will put it up on the post DEF CON pages together with my slides if you want it where I have uh, implemented a small vulnerable server, s vulnerable server that accepts connection, receives commands with this uh, restric restriction, calls this vulnerable parse and execute function, and is possible to exploit. And also I will provide, of course, a remote client with these exploits. And they cannot be used on anything but this particular server, of course. OK, so I'm a little surprised that you didn't ask this before I got to the slide. But isn't it interesting how we um, will manage to use the existing connection? I say we have to find the socket descriptor, 
descriptor and use it. And how to find it is by finding the accept call. The accept call can be found by disassembling the server and uh, maybe look for an error message or something. And then uh, set a breakpoint at that address in the code and debug the program. And then look where the return value from the accept call is being stored in memory because the accept call returns the uh, socket description descriptor for the um, session socket. There's a plenty of uh, disassemblers available on the internet and that's just one example. That one's free. If you run a disassembler on uh, the server that I'm providing, you will get this. And if you look through the disassembled code, you will find an um, error message that is quite useful. It shows us that the uh, accept function is uh, probably that one. And then we know that we uh, can set our breakpoint at this address. Then we debug the program, and we get this. We see where the uh, session socket is being stored. And then, OK, so we, ha we have found it. And then to use it, we need to know that the uh, socket's position within the stack frame does not change. Well, the stack frame itself might change. The stack frame's position might change, that is. So if we know a fixed position within the stack frame, we can calculate where the socket is being stored and reuse it. So this is second animation. And it shows what the pa first payload is basically doing. When the first payload starts, the base pointer has been overwritten, and the stack pointer points towards the end of the first payload. First I do is to uh, change the base pointer and um, move the stack pointer upwards to against, against uh, free memory. Then I add some um, arguments for the receive function. I set a pointer to the buffer where we want to store the second, the second payload in free memory. And then the socket. Because I know the distance from I know that the distance from the base pointer to the socket will always be the same, and the base pointer will be set during runtime, so I, I can always find the socket descriptor. Descriptor. So that's using the socket. To further minimize and optimize the code of the first payload, I suggest to use those functions that have already been loaded by the server. And of course the server needs to use some functions from the Windows Socket library. I mean it receives the first payload. And the addresses to this function are being stored at known places in within the instructions of the server process as long as it hasn't been relocated, while the uh, library may be stored wherever in memory. Not wherever, but at an unknown place. So this is what happens when the uh, server calls a function within the Windows Socket library. The server uses its, uses its uh, jump table. And if we uh, disassemble the server code one more time, we find this. This is the jump table. and. Uh, by just reading the code or by debugging, we can um, deduce that uh, these addresses correspond to these functions. So if we want to do a receive function, or if we want to call the receive function, we can do it like this. Are you following? This is just a picture of the first payload in memory. As you can see, the addresses are printed to the left. And this is the code itself. As you can see, I start by subtracting um, at, least, at least as much um, at least as much amount of memory from the stack pointer that I, that I need to store the second payload. Then I push the arguments to um, the receive function onto the stack, the new stack frame. 
and then I basically calls the uh, receive function through the jump table within the server and then I jump to the second payload you have any questions on this first payload I have some pens no ah anyway okay so what's to send the second time I mean you can send whatever you can send your code of choice you do not need to uh, to um, feel any restrictions for the size of the code to send the second time you can send code that uh, opens the shell and performs um, or performs whatever action you want to do to exploit this server and remember you may still use the same socket you may still use the jump table for the functions that ho has already been loaded as well as you might might try to load your own libraries and look up new functions another important thing concerning the second payload is that we do not need to XOR protect the second payload because it's being sent to the stack it's being written to the stack as raw data over a socket the first payload is written to the stack by a string copy operation and as you m probably know we cannot have any nulls within that because then the string copy function will stop so we need to XOR protect them but for the second payload we do not need to bother to XOR protect the data the proof of concept implementation that I have made it's it does not exploit the server in any particular way it just confirms its success by sending a short message back to the client okay so this is a picture of um, what the se second payload does. When the second payload starts running, the base pointer still points to the base of the first payload, and the stack pointer points to the, um, to the top of the second payload. The instruction pointer is, of course, at the top of the second payload because we have made a jump. I call the send function. I, add, I push um, this, the arguments for the send function to the stack, and I call the stack, and I call the send function. Sorry. And then I'm finishing up when I'm finishing up I want to do a clean return because as you remember if I do a clean return I won't get any uh, entry to the system log and I will I can use that to uh, possibly evade a host based intrusion detection system so to be able to do a clean return I need to reset the base pointer and the stack pointer to their uh, Original, originally intended positions uh, with respect to the first stack frame, the stack frame of the calling function, and I need to reset the instruction pointer to point back into the service or instruction codes. Of course, if the uh, parse and execute function is supposed to return anything special, I have to set set that up as well. Since I haven't changed the base pointer throughout the execution of the second payload and I remember that the uh, base pointer did point did point to the <laughs> okay the base pointer did point to the stack pointer before I started hmm. I can simply set them back and since I know that the stack frame of the calling function is always of the same size I can calculate what to, what to set the base pointer to I mean all of these stack frames may their position in memory may change and I do not know that until runtime but what I do know is that the size of the stack frame is always the same and thereby I can calculate what to set the base pointer to and then I can do a clean return back to the server back to the service or original instructions with the, both the uh, stack pointer and the base pointer reset to its original values and the stack frame of the calling function not disrupted in any way do you have any questions? yeah you want, you want the pen before? <laughs> nah, sorry let's say you just have a okay the question was can you do this without having the source code for the server and the answer is 
Yes, if you um, manage to um, to read only the disassembly. If you have the binary, you can still disassemble it. Okay, if it's a um, it's a only remote situation. No, you need to disassemble the uh, server. But since you're only supposed to um, evaluate your own programs, you will probably have access to the binary, right? You want a black one or a purple one? Okay. Cool. Any more questions? Yeah. The first payload overwrites the original return address. Yes. Okay, how do I know what to set the instruction pointer to, to do a clean return? I get it from the disassembly code. And it will be the same... Excuse me? Excuse me? Um, I don't know if I got it right, but let's try to um, answer something and see if it fits. Um, when I disassemble the server, I can find the address for the call, and I know that the return supposed return address is the address next, the next address. And as long as the server hasn't been relocated in memory, the, this address will be the same. Because are you taking a picture? <laughs> Thanks. I, I thank you. Uh, as long as the server hasn't been relocated or anything, its base address will always be this double uh, forty double double o it's set you can set that when you compi compile your binary and you will see it when you disassemble your binary too you want a purple or a black one you don't want any okay Yes, Stephen. Yes, I think this can be made on uh, other servers as well. But I'm only providing a, a proof of concept and uh, something that I made myself and I don't even know if it's legal to disassemble programs here. But it, it is probably le legal to disassemble your own programs. I mean, there are a number of conditions that has to be met for this to, to work out. I mean, the, the first payload cannot overwrite the... Uh, it cannot be allowed to disrupt the first stack frame. And that that might be true, that might be possible, or that might not be possible. And there are some other conditions that has to be met too. But I think the concept, the idea, it will be able to do on other servers as well. Yes, you? Okay, the question was how effective is a non-executable stack frame? I would say it's quite effective. But um, let's say one possible way to get around it might be to uh, to jump to um, maybe an argument that is being stored on the heap or something instead. Basically, I I'm kind of amazed that uh, stack frames aren't being uh, protected from execution. You want the last pun? <laughs> it 
Sorry. Okay, so I ran out of pens, I ran out of free stuff, and I'm basically running out of slides too, so I'm going to finish off and um, show this is just the payloads in memory. And uh, as you can see, I just send a simple stupid message back from the second payload to the calling client. This is uh, the code for the second payload. As you can see, it's basically just a number of push operations to push the arguments to the send function and then call the send, send function through the jump table of the server and then reset the um, stack pointers and uh, return. So the return address in this example is hard coded into the second payload. You can see it on the second last line to the right. To summarize this, I've um, discussed the double injection. And by a double injection, I mean that we have we send a se first pay we send one payload that uploads a second payload and then jumps to the second payload, and that the second payload executes the actual exploit, like the sh a shell or something. I have suggested to try to use an existing network connection by finding and uh, supplying an existing socket descriptor to the receive and send functions. And I have also suggested to try to use the existing functions, the preloaded ones, through the jump table of the original program. By doing this, it might be possible to evade a network-based intrusion detection system. There are no elite ports and no TCP handshakes since we are sorry, using the existing network connections. There are not as long as for the first payload there are no large amount of, uh, amounts of data being sent. And it, this, um, by doing this, we uh, force a network-based intrusion detection system into interpreting the application protocol to see and uh, detect the changes of my uh, payloads from an original um, yeah, application protocol. And that int interpretation will probably, it will definitely increase the complexity of the I IDS and it will, it will probably decrease the uh, capacity and slow down analysis. Have you read through Caesar's uh, ASCII encoding paper? That can also be used as a counter, if a, if application protocol interpretation by the network-based intrusion detection system is a countermeasure against this attack, Caesar's ask, asking coding can be seen as a counter-countermeasure. So you can continue this. By not setting up any new connections and by, no, by returning cleanly without a crash, there will be no log entry. And that will force a host-based intrusion detection system to uh, kind of uh, get some strange behavior awareness because the server won't function properly but it, it won't crash either and to, to be able to recognize the difference between those two you need well some kind of um, n abnormal behavior detection and that will add complexity too almost finished I really recommend you to read this the first one it's a chapter in the book called Hackproofing Your Network by Greg Hoagland. It's really good. And the second paper I really recommend you to read is uh, about uh, Windows buffer overflows from Frack by Barnaby Jack, also known as the Dark Spirit. Is any of you guys here? No. I give you credit anyway. If you have any questions about this, if you want more information, if you want to see a demonstration, if you want to have a copy of the code or the slides, you can probably get them from the post DEF CON pages or you can try to catch me here during the day. I will be here all day and all night probably and I'll leave back home for Sweden tomorrow morning. Or you can also um, drop me an email at this email address. Any last question? Yeah. With TCP and UDP, 
but I think the concept is uh, possible for uh, yeah. okay thank you very much for attending and uh, please stay for the Cisco routers as well thank you